Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out here to uh, hear a little bit about brown dwarfs, the uh, unfortunate middle child of astronomy. They usually get uh, lost in all the uh, attention paid to stars and to planets, uh, but hopefully I can talk to you a little bit about why they're actually interesting in their own right as well. Um, as Greg mentioned, I'm Eric Nielsen. I'm a research scientist uh, here at Stanford. I work down on campus. Uh, my main research interests are direct detection of extrasolar planets, of brown dwarfs, of actually studying them and trying to understand uh, where they came from. And hopefully I can share a little bit of uh, what we've learned recently uh, uh, with you all today. Okay. Um, just to sort of set the stage, uh, this is a uh, uh, movie from the uh, Recons team uh, looking at the solar neighborhood, looking at uh, stars uh, within uh, a few light years of the sun. And basically what's going to happen is the movie is just going to zoom out from the solar system. Uh, it's pulling out now through the Oort cloud, uh, just uh, pulling out uh, further and further away from the sun and seeing what systems pop up as we move further and further away. Uh, once we get out to about four light years, we, we hit the, uh, the first uh, star uh, other than our sun, uh, which is the Alpha Centauri system. Um, and then as we pull out further and further away, uh, more and more stars appear. And so, you know, the average distance between stars is a couple of light years. Um, and we see that the solar neighborhood is actually, you know, uh, uh, pretty uh, packed with uh, lots and lots of different stars. Um, the one, one trend you may notice is that a lot of them are red. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, and so pulling out to about 33 light years, uh, we see the, the results of a census of uh, uh, pretty much every star uh, within that radius. Just wait for it to finish, there we go. Okay, so again, the, the, the group that put this together is called RECONS, the Research Consortium on Nearby Stars. Uh, they did a census uh, of all stars within about uh, 10 parsecs, 33 light years, um, you know, well-timed for the uh, census that we're in the US are gonna do in about a year. Um, and, and literally just counting up every single star, every single brown dwarf, uh, every single stellar remnant uh, within that radius. And what they found uh, by doing this, this full-on census uh, was about 20 stars that look like the sun, about half as many that are more massive than the sun, and then over 300 that are less massive than the sun. So this is the first thing that sort of jumped out at you immediately. We do not, or, uh, we do not orbit an uh, ordinary star. Most stars are lower mass than our own sun. Um, so you add those all together, you get about 350 stars. Uh, um, also in that uh, uh, 10 parsec radius, uh, 50 brown dwarfs. So there's a lot of brown dwarfs out there. Um, there's about, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the Milky Way galaxy as a whole, there's about uh, uh, 200 billion stars, and so that works out to about uh, 20 billion brown dwarfs uh, in our galaxy alone. So there's, there really are a lot of brown dwarfs. They've been, uh, uh, we've only really been able to study them in detail for the past uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, and hopefully I can tell you a little bit about what we've learned uh, in that time. Okay, so first of all, definitions. What, uh, what do we mean when we say brown dwarf? Um, it, it's a purely mass definition. So let's, let's go through mass a little bit here. So if you think about planets, uh, and just rank them according to mass here from low mass at the bottom to high mass at the top, go from the, low, uh, the, the uh, lower mass planets, like rocky planets, like the Earth here, uh, higher mass planets, ice giants, up to gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, uh, all the way up to about 13 Jupiter masses, a, a relatively arbitrary uh, boundary uh, that we call the upper limit of planets. Anything lower than 13 Jupiter masses, uh, we call a planet. At the high end, we have the stars. Uh, so the stars like the sun, star, uh, more high mass stars, more low mass stars. And then we have another boundary here at 75 Jupiter masses, 75 times the mass of Jupiter. Uh, anything above that uh, becomes a star. And this is, this is a slightly more physical limit. Uh, this is the mass you need to actually fuse hydrogen into helium. Uh, so inside, inside of a, uh, uh, any star, deep in the core, temperatures and pressures are so high that the hydrogen fuses into helium, and this is the energy source for stars. This is what ca causes them to shine. This is what stops them from collapsing. Uh, most stars spend most of their lives uh, uh, just you know, day by day by day fusing hydrogen into helium, which provides them with their energy. But you can only do that uh, if, if you have enough gravity to keep the core hot enough. And that limit is about 75 Jupiter masses. And so we have these, these two boundaries here. Uh, everything below 13 Jupiter masses is a planet. Everything above 75 Jupiter masses is a star. And that blank space in between is the brown dwarfs. And so the, the name brown dwarf is a, is a purely mass definition. Anything that falls in this mass range, anything bigger than 13 times the mass of Jupiter, smaller than 75 ma uh, times the mass of Jupiter, we call a brown dwarf. 
And this, this is also why they come about, uh, they're sometimes called failed stars. They just didn't get enough uh, mass to ignite uh, nuclear fusion in their core, uh, and they're, they're uh, you know, somewhere below. And so I'm gonna try and talk a little bit about how they fit into this uh, uh, range. How are they like stars? How are they like planets? What's really going on with them? Okay. So start out a little bit, just, I just wanna talk a little bit about uh, uh, how, we talk, how we think about stars, how we classify them, and for astronomers, uh, the, the main way we classify stars is by temperature, specifically temperature at the surface, the, the, the outer envelope of the star, the part we can actually see, what's the temperature at the surface? Um, and the, the temperature uh, ranges uh, quite a bit, uh, about an order of magnitude here, um, and we use these uh, special letters called spectral types uh, to basically encode what the uh, 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 temperature of the surface of the star is. So all the way from the hottest star, uh, O-type star, uh, coolest star, the M star. And the great thing about uh, stars is so long as they're currently burning hydrogen into helium, uh, they all look pretty much the same. And so uh, temperature for stars that are burning hydrogen into helium, that are fusing hydrogen into helium, uh, temperature tracks mass, tracks radius. So the, the, the hottest stars are also the most massive stars, are also the physically largest stars. Similarly, the smallest stars uh, in terms of mass are the smallest stars in terms of radius, and also the coolest stars. And so if you tell me a star is a G star, I know it's, it, it's uh, this, about the same size as the sun, same mass as the sun, same temperature as the sun, so long as it's currently uh, fusing hydrogen into helium. Um, the reason that these letters are in this uh, very nonsensical order is uh, a bit of a historical accident. Uh, if you ever want to uh, remember the order OBA uh, FGKM, uh, my suggestion is only bad astronomers feel good knowing mnemonics. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, in, in terms of numbers, uh, this is a little pie chart here just shows uh, how many of each spectral type uh, uh, we have in the galaxy. Uh, the vast majority are M stars. So again, most stars are less massive than the sun. So a full three quarters of all stars are these low mass M stars, the coolest of all stars. Uh, another significant chunk, the K stars, and then the, the stars like the sun, the G stars, are, are again relatively rare with even fewer stars more massive than that. So again, most stars less massive than the sun. Um, the, one of the reasons we like to use temperature is temperature really encodes the, uh, the light that we see from these stars. It tells us about uh, the light that we see, uh, uh, how much uh, energy we get, and what sort of energy that, that comes out as. And to just give some you know, everyday examples here, uh, this is an incandescent light bulb. Uh, for you younger people in the audience, you can consult a nearby museum as to what an incandescent light bulb is. Uh, but back in the day, we would heat a filament of tungsten to about 3,000 Kelvin, and it would glow uh, uh, in the visible uh, part of the spectrum. So basically, you get visible light uh, by heating something up to, uh, uh, to this high temperature. And essentially what's happening is uh, uh, atoms will give, uh, give off light uh, depending on what their temperature is. The higher the temperature, uh, the, the shorter wavelength of light that they will emit. So at 3,000 Kelvin, you'll get some visible light. Uh, if you heat up an uh, 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 element on your stove up to its maximum, it could hit a temperature as high as about 500 Kelvin, and uh, most of the light will come off in the infrared, but there'll be a significant chunk of uh, energy coming out in the uh, red as well. And you'll see the, 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 the stove actually start to turn red just because of how hot that element actually is. Uh, one, more one more item from around the house, uh, human beings. Uh, an off-the-shelf human being runs around uh, 300 Kelvin. Um, it gives off most of the energy in, uh, in the infrared, the deep in the thermal infrared. Uh, so if you have a special infrared camera, uh, you can actually see the energy being given off uh, just by a human being at the, uh, um, you know, at, at everyday body temperature. This is actually a self-portrait of me trying to prove that I'm actually an infrared astronomer. Okay. All right, um, so, the, so, so this is true for, you know, uh, uh, items here on Earth. It's true for stars as well. Uh, the, the hottest stars end up uh, becoming blue, uh, so, they're, they're so the surfaces are so hot uh, that most of their energy is in the uh, actually ultraviolet part of the spectrum, and they look blue uh, uh, to the naked eye. Uh, similarly, the, the coolest stars, uh, energy start, most of the energy is coming out in the uh, infrared, and they look red uh, to the naked eye, with sort of a, a whitish yellow in the middle here. And so the temperature of the star controls uh, uh, what, what sort of light we actually see from it. So what does this mean for the brown dwarfs? Well, brown dwarfs are gonna be cooler than the coolest star. They, they, they don't uh, undergo fusion, they can't keep themselves warm, and so in general, they're gonna be uh, even cooler uh, than these M stars here. And so if we wanna look for brown dwarfs, we shouldn't look in the ultraviolet, we shouldn't look in the visible, uh, we should probably look in the infrared. The infrared is probably gonna be the best, our best shot at actually imaging these things. 
So uh, this, this is a shot of the Pleiades in the visible. This is uh, from the Digitized Sky Survey. Uh, the Pleiades named for the seven sisters of Greek mythology, uh, so named because there are seven stars uh, visible to the naked eye. And you know, in the visible, they, those seven stars really, really dominate the image. If you look in the exact same field, but you look in the uh, infrared instead, uh, you know, th those seven stars are still there, but they're not quite so dominant. Uh, you start to pick up a lot more the, uh, the other, the fainter stars, and in particular, you start picking up a lot of the uh, uh, M stars that were a lot harder to see in the visible that become a lot more prominent in the uh, infrared. Okay, so step one, looking the infrared. Um, uh, th there are other tricks as well to uh, uh, pick up these brown dwarfs. Um, and I actually wanted to go through uh, one uh, really nice trick that's been used just in the last few years uh, to identify the, uh, the, the very closest brown dwarfs to the sun. Uh, ones that basically have only been identified in the past 10 years or so. Uh, that were there hiding all along, uh, but we were, we were only able to actually identify them uh, starting in 2012. And so we use a technique called uh, proper motion. And the, the idea here is pretty straightforward. You just take images year after year after year of a field of stars and look for the one that's moving. And you know, hopefully you spotted that one there. Uh, that's quite obviously not, not, uh, not like the rest of them. And what's happening uh, here is all the nearby stars are orbiting the center of the galaxy uh, you know, uh, uh, in their own specific orbits and moving relative to each other. Any star that's really, really close to us is going to appear to move at a much uh, faster rate. The analogy I have is imagine you're at an airport watching a plane taking off. It's going to go across your field of view in a couple of seconds. Similarly, if you're sitting out in a field somewhere and watching a plane pass overhead, it'll take several minutes to go across your field of view. Just because uh, when, when the plane is you know, physically closer to you, it appears to be moving much faster. And that's the same idea here. Any star that's uh, uh, quite close to the sun uh, will appear to just be ju uh, uh, zipping across the sky compared to the much more distant stars in the background. And so this star here is Proxima Centauri. This is the, the, the closest star to the sun. Um, and it's, it's just, you know, uh, 10 years of motion from image after image after image. So um, the, uh, the brown dwarf that we're discovering this way uh, is something we call Lumen 16. And again, this is a very recent discovery, just uh, uh, 2012, about seven years ago, uh, when, when this, this was identified, uh, using this proper motion method. I should explain what's going on here. Th these are four different images from four completely different sky surveys using different telescopes, different wavelengths, which is why the stars appear to get bigger and smaller from image to image to image. Uh, the size of a star on the image depends on the, the size of your telescope, the wavelength you're looking at. And so ignore the fact the stars are you know, changing all, all the time, but you do see this one object that's moving across the field there, and that's Lumen 16. Uh, it's not just a brown dwarf, it's actually a pair of brown dwarfs. It's two brown dwarfs uh, in this uh, very, uh, very close uh, uh, binary configuration here. Uh, this, uh, this is the actual uh, data we have. Uh, here's a you know, nice little artist conception. Uh, so sort of two objects, sort of you know, uh, uh, Jupiter-ish, uh, with the sun in the background uh, uh, of the image there. So, you know, brand new close, uh, close binary. Uh, the closest brown dwarfs to the sun, uh, Lumen 16. Uh, one more found in this, this way, uh, this uh, object with a very long, confusing serial number for a name here, uh, found by the WISE telescope and the very long, uh, confusing coordinates uh, for you know, where, where the object was, also found using this proper motion uh, method by stringing together years and years of data, you see it moving across the sky compared to the background stars. So uh, this, uh, after Lumen 16, this is the next closest brown dwarf to the sun. Okay, so, so let's, let's put that all together. So what are the closest neighbors to the sun? We, we talked about the, the uh, t uh, 33 uh, light year sample. Uh, this is the e even closer sample, just the, the handful of stars uh, that, that are closest to us here. So um, for all the stars, all the brown dwarfs close to us, uh, the very closest one should not be a surprise, is our friend the sun. Uh, next up, the Alpha Centauri system. This is a triple system with, an F, uh, with a G star, a K star, and an M star possibly a couple of planets as well, orbiting some of those members. Uh, number three, another M star called Barnard star, uh, which was also identified as being very nearby almost 100 years ago by this uh, proper motion met uh, method as well. Uh, next up, Lumen 16. So number four on the list already uh, is a couple of brown dwarfs. Uh, our friend Wise 0855 is next. And finally, Wolf 359. Um, ask a Star Trek fan why, why that name sounds familiar to you. But yeah, so you know, of, of all the star, of the six, of the six uh, uh, systems that are closest to us, uh, there, there's uh, two G stars, a K star, three M stars, and three brown dwarfs. 
So not only are there a lot of brown dwarfs out there, they're a lot closer than you think they are. Okay. All right, so um, the, the study of brown dwarfs has been uh, you know, a pretty recent thing. Uh, it really required the advent of you know, wide, uh, wide area surveys, uh, as well as infrared detectors, uh, to really be able to detect these, uh, these objects uh, for the first time. And really, starting in about 1995, 1996, uh, was when astron uh, you know, brown dwarf signs you know, really started to take off. And uh, the, the, the reason it sort of took to that point uh, was astronomers really needed to convince themselves that they were actually looking at brown dwarfs and not just looking at very low mass stars. And the thing that ended up convincing uh, astronomers is lithium. So if you haven't uh, consulted your periodic table recently, uh, hydrogen, helium, number three is lithium. Uh, so the, the, the third element on the periodic table uh, the Big Bang produces hydrogen, produces helium, it produces you know, trace amounts of lithium, something of order uh, um, uh, one lithium atom for every billion hydrogen atoms, um, and that, you know, those trace amounts uh, basically become part of you know, anything that forms. They become part of, part of stars, they become part of brown dwarfs, part of planets. And so um, you know, any star or brown dwarf that is formed, uh, it, it has a little bit of lithium built into it. So you can think of it as a gift from the early universe. Uh, what, 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 what do stars do with this gift? Well, they squander it. Uh, so, uh, star, stars uh, fuse that lithium away as quickly as they can. And essentially what happens is it's really easy to fuse lithium uh, plus, a, plus a proton into two helium atoms. It, it's so easy, in fact, it, it happens at a much lower temperature than you need to fuse hydrogen into helium. And so if a, if a, if a star is, is uh, the core is hot enough to fuse hydrogen into helium, it can really easily fu fuse that lithium away. And so any lithium that finds its way into the core of a star, it's gone. Uh, it, it's very quickly destroyed, uh, converted into helium. And uh, you know, so uh, how, how does lithium find its way into the core? Well, uh, stars are you know, largely convective. There, there's large convective zones where material is just constantly being dredged around the star. So for a star like the sun, between about you know, half and 1.5 solar masses, there's a convective outer layer here and a non-convective zone in the center. But for the lower mass stars, that anything lower than about half the mass of the sun, the entire star is convective. So any lithium on the surface is gonna find its way into the core, get destroyed by fusion, and never find its way back up. And so low mass stars very quickly de uh, destroy their entire supply of lithium uh, quite early on in their lifetime. And so uh, you know, if, if we're looking for evidence for this, uh, we, we, the way that we astronomers look for uh, 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 to try to understand the composition of objects is we take spectra. Uh, we look at the light from an object, split it up by wavelength, and look for signs of molecules, uh, of atoms and molecules in the atmosphere uh, based on the lines we see in that spectrum. So again, uh, this is uh, wavelength here, 6,700 angstroms is about uh, uh, the, the red part of the spectrum here. Uh, amount of flux here on the y-axis. And anytime you see an absorption line, this, this little dip down, uh, that's a sign of an atom in the atmosphere of the star that's absorbing light at that specific wavelength. And so all four of these stars, they have calcium. And so you see this, uh, uh, li this line here uh, precisely where calcium has a transition. Uh, there's also iron lines, they all have iron. Uh, and some of them have lithium absorption and one doesn't. And essentially what, what you're seeing here is the difference between young stars and old stars. Uh, young stars have not yet had a chance to destroy their lithium. They're trying very hard. They're gonna get there one day. Uh, but, but they still have a little bit of that primordial lithium left. Uh, the old star has completely destroyed its lithium supply, so, so there's no lithium left. And so this is a, a neat trick to, to use to tell the difference between old stars and young stars based on how much lithium they have uh, left. And if you put this all together, this becomes a beautiful test for whether or not an object is a brown dwarf. So let me go through it. So a brown dwarf like a star is gonna be entirely convective. So any lithium on the surface is gonna make it down to the core of the brown dwarf and back up. Uh, for a star, any material that makes it down to the core will be destroyed because the, the, the core of the star is hot enough to fuse hydrogen into helium and therefore it's hot enough to fuse lithium as well. Uh, the brown dwarf will have a cooler core and the, the, the lithium can go to the core and come back without being fused away. So you can find an object that's old enough that were it a star, it should have destroyed its lithium by now, uh, but, um, but you know, still has uh, some lithium left over, that's a sign that you're looking at a brown dwarf. And this was the thing that convinced astronomers in 1996 uh, that we were actually looking at uh, you know, actual brown dwarfs. We weren't just fooling ourselves by looking at uh, uh, very low mass stars. Uh, a series of brown dwarf candidates in the Pleiades, um, all with uh, deep uh, you know, lithium absorption lines. And so, you know, lithium was, was the uh, you know, so-called smoking gun 
uh, to really show that you know, we were actually looking at real brown dwarfs based on the fact that uh, uh, you know, the stars should have destroyed that lithium by now, these brown dwarfs still had it. Okay, so that's a little historical aside. Once you have uh, actual detections, actual discoveries, um, the, the, the process in science is you immediately write a press release, and to go along with your press release, you, you uh, contact an artist to make beautiful images for you. And so we get these beautiful images then you know, of, of, uh, of the new brown dwarf discoveries here. Uh, and, and these are actually you know, uh, probably pretty close to what's going on. This, the planet in the foreground is completely fictional. Uh, but other than that, everything looks pretty good in this image here. So uh, you know, the brown dwarfs that, you know, that are quite hot, that look a lot like low mass stars. Uh, brown dwarfs that are cooler look sort of like a you know, uh, slightly brighter Jupiter. Um, and so there's a, a pretty big range in depending on the temperature of the brown dwarf in what they probably actually look like. Okay. So what are they actually? You know, uh, um, what are their actual physical properties? And if you ask astronomers, uh, there's always one question they want to answer first when they want to understand an object. And that's basically, um, how does it stand up to gravity? That, you know, gra uh, anytime you have a massive object, gravity's gonna try and make it collapse. What stops that collapse? Uh, for objects like the Earth here, uh, what, what, ends, uh, what, what stops that collapse is basically uh, pressure from liquids and solids. Uh, they, they, they push back against uh, uh, compression uh, and they hold, the uh, they hold the planet up. And so that works for you know, low mass planets like the Earth. It holds up for, you know, for asteroids, for, uh, for comets and things like that. Uh, it does not hold for giant planets. Uh, uh, on the high mass end of stars, nuclear fusion uh, pushes back against gravity. The energy produced by nuclear fusion uh, pushes back a a as the star tries to collapse. So what about in between? What about for brown dwarfs? What about for uh, giant planets? They're bo the, uh, both sets are too big for solid or liquid pressure to, to push back against gravity, but too small to ignite nuclear fusion. Why don't they collapse? What, what, what do they do to hold back against gravity? Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna assume that you all consulted your quantum mechanics textbooks before you came here, and reminded yourself a little bit about uh, the Pauli exclusion principle. And the Pauli exclusion principle is actually what's behind uh, uh, the giant planets and the brown dwarfs being able to hold themselves up against gravity. This thing we call electron degeneracy pressure. And the, the, the statement of the Pauli exclusion principle is that two fermions cannot uh, occupy the same, quantum, uh, the, qu the same quantum state at the same time. Electrons are fermions, protons are fermions, neutrons are fermions, and this metaphor here, cars are fermions as well. So um, imagine, a, imagine a parking lot. If the parking lot has lots and lots of open spaces and you try to compress a bunch of cars, try to push a, a bunch of cars to the same location, things are okay. There, there's a lot of spaces where you can put those extra cars uh, and, and uh, everything behaves the way you would expect. As those spaces get to uh, be filled up, uh, th there actually ends up being this, this pressure. That you, it's uh, something that stops you from being able to continue to push more cars in the same location simply because there's physically no space to put them anymore. And something similar is happening for the electrons as well. Uh, as, as you try to compress material, if there's plenty of quantum, state, uh, quantum states available for those electrons to go into, you can keep pushing that material closer and closer together, but eventually you'll hit a limit uh, where all the, all the quantum states are filled up and uh, you just physically can't uh, compress the material any further because there's no place for the electrons to go. And so this is what is actually holding up both giant planets like Jupiter as well as uh, brown dwarfs. This electron degeneracy pressure uh, is the thing that's pushing back against gravity. And that has a couple sort of you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, fun consequences. Uh, one of them is that uh, across a broad range of masses, um, things are exactly the same size. So all the way up from Jupiter uh, you know, at one Jupiter mass, uh, all the way up to a 90 Jupiter mass star, all these objects are about the same size. There, there's a you know, factor of 90 difference in mass, sizes are all about the same. Uh, it, it, th there's even a little bit of uh, a weird counterintuitive th thing going on, which is actually larger objects are, sm uh, uh, more massive objects are smaller than less massive objects. You know, this is, uh, you know, think of a snowball. You add more snow to a, to a snowball, the snowball gets bigger. The opposite happens for brown dwarfs. You add more mass to a brown dwarf, it becomes smaller. All, all a result of uh, degeneracy pressure. Okay. So that's one way that, that uh, uh, both brown dwarfs and giant planets are different than stars. They're, they're, they're not held by, by fusion, they're held by this degeneracy pressure. Uh, one more way they're different is because they're not fusing uh, uh, hydrogen to helium because they have no internal energy source, they, they cool down over time. And so unlike stars where we can just talk about, uh, okay, a star of this mass will have this temperature as long as it's fusing hydrogen, it's this nice stable thing, that's not the case for brown dwarfs for planets. They cool over time. They start out uh, just being born very, very hot, 
hotter than some stars in many cases, uh, then they cool down uh, cooler and cooler and cooler over time. And so, uh, you know, you, you can't really talk about, you know, what's the temperature of this brown dwarf, what's the temperature of this planet? You have to tell me the age as well, because it just keeps cooling and cooling over time. Okay. Uh, so here's a, here's a fun uh, uh, theoretical uh, plot of just how, uh, how these objects are cooling, how they're getting fainter over time. So on the x-axis here is age, uh, from one million years after the object forms, all the way up to 10 billion years after the object forms, uh, brightness on the y-axis from faint to bright here, and in the blue is, is, what, is how stars evolve, green is the brown dwarfs, and red is the planets. So stars uh, start, start out hot uh, just as they form. They, they cool down, they contract over time. Meanwhile, the core is getting hotter and hotter as more material comes into it. And eventually the core gets hot enough to ignite nuclear fusion, at which point nuclear fusion stops the contraction, stops the cooling, and, and the, the brightness of stars just levels out as it, as it happily burns uh, uh, hydrogen as long as it has hydrogen to burn. Uh, so there's a uh, nice uh, stability given by you know, sustained nuclear fusion. Brown dwarfs, they, they initially follow the, uh, uh, the, the, the same path. They're cooling and contracting over time. There's a glimmer of false hope that they get because uh, just like there's a little bit of lithium left over from the Big Bang, there's a little bit of deuterium left over from the Big Bang. Deuterium is a heavier isotope of hydrogen. Uh, just a, you know, little trace amounts left from the Big Bang. Uh, and it's actually even easier to fuse deuterium than it is to fuse lithium. And so these brown dwarfs will fuse deuterium uh, in their core, which will temporarily push back against gravity. But there's not a lot of deuterium, and they have no way of making more once they finish fusing it. And so there's this little blip where things uh, you know, uh, uh, start to uh, smooth out, and then they start you know, uh, dropping again. They, they start dropping in brightness, they start, uh, start dropping in temperature as well. Uh, once, they, once they finish fusing their deuterium, all hope is lost. There, there's nothing else for them to do uh, to stop this cooling, to stop this contraction. Uh, they're gonna stop contracting when they hit the degeneracy limit, but they'll just keep cooling and cooling uh, uh, as time goes on. Uh, planets will ne we'll actually never get hot enough to even fuse deuterium. And so this is the arbitrary line that we, divide, we use to divide planet, uh, giant planets and brown dwarfs. At 13 Jupiter masses, uh, above that, you're hot enough to fuse deuterium, below that you're not. And so this is, again, a somewhat arbitrary boundary uh, where we say brown dwarfs end and planets begin. 13 times the mass of Jupiter based on your ability to fuse deuterium very early on in your life. Okay. So what, what sort of temperatures uh, uh, um, are, are the surfaces of these objects? And again, remember, this, this depends on how old the brown dwarf is uh, because they're gonna cool down over time. So the very uh, youngest objects uh, you know, are gonna be pretty much as hot as, as the lowest mass stars, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of degrees. Uh, as they get older, uh, th they'll start to cool down more and more. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, 100 Celsius, you know, the temperature of boiling water, uh, something that, you know, very, very cold, uh, you know, a good winter in Fargo, uh, North Dakota, uh, a sort of cold, uh, so, you know, you know, actually relatively chilly uh, 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 surfaces. So, so this is, you know, some of the more, uh, most recently found brown dwarfs have these, you know, very, very cold surface temperatures. Okay. So let's uh, go, go back to uh, our little diagram of stars here. Remember, we classify stars by their surface temperature. Uh, and with, these, uh, with this little coding here, OBA FGKM, uh, to denote uh, what the temp surface temperature of these stars is. As we introduce brown dwarfs, we're gonna need to introduce new spectral types as well. And so we introduced these three brand new spectral types, L, T, and Y, uh, to, to get these even colder temperatures you need to describe uh, both brown dwarfs and giant planets. Because remember, giant planets also play this game of starting out very hot and then cooling over time. And of course, we have to update the mnemonic. Uh, only bad astronomers feel good knowing mnemonics like this, yo. It's got, it's gotten me through many a test. <laughs> and, and so we can you know, update this uh, temperature chart, uh, not just with temperatures, uh, but with the uh, uh, spectral types uh, of these objects as well. So again, hottest objects, uh, they're, they're actually you know, uh, uh, the same spectral type as the low mass stars. They, they have, they're, they're an M dwarf spectral type, even though they're a brown dwarf. Go down to the L's, the T's, and finally the Y dwarfs as well, the, the, uh, the very uh, coolest of these objects. And again, remember, you know, the, the fact that something is an L dwarf, it doesn't tell me that it's a brown dwarf or a planet, it could be either. I need to know the age before I can tell you uh, what the mass of that object is because all these things cool over time. So in fact, you, you actually are already familiar with an example of the Y dwarf class, uh, Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter's temperature puts it in the, in the Y dwarf cat category as well. 
Um, uh, you know, Jupiter started out life as an, uh, as probably as an M or an L dwarf, cooled down to a T, and then finally cooled down to a Y. Planet the whole time, but it went through these different uh, spectral uh, uh, classes uh, as the surface got colder and colder as it uh, uh, contracted with time. Okay. So uh, what, what do these temperatures actually mean for what's going on in the atmosphere? Well, once again, I'm going to take a quick step back to stars to, to remind ourselves how, how this all works. Uh, so on the surface of a, of a star like the sun, uh, the atmosphere is actually relatively boring. It's, it's just a lot of ionized gas, hydrogen, helium, trace amounts of everything else, iron, oxygen, uh, uh, carbon. Um, you know, not a lot of really uh, you know, exciting stuff going on in terms of chemistry on the surface of the sun. Uh, for small stars, things get a little bit more interesting. Uh, the, the, the surface has cooled enough that you can actually get molecules on the surface of these stars. And so things like titanium oxide, vanadium oxide, carbon monoxide are, are you know, uh, things that we can see in the spectra uh, that is actually uh, uh, existing on the surfaces of these stars. And it gets even better for the brown dwarfs. Uh, because not only do we get these uh, molecules, you actually start to get clouds forming in the atmospheres of these objects. And so when you go from M to L, you start getting uh, 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 <coughs> calcium oxide, titanium oxide clouds. Um, you move, uh, you cool down from the uh, ML tr transition to L dwarfs. Uh, you still have these calcium titanium oxide clouds, but they're lower in the atmosphere now. Uh, near the surface, you have, you're starting to have silicon clouds, and my personal favorites, uh, liquid iron uh, clouds uh, uh, starting to form on, uh, on these things, so a chance of uh, liquid iron rain. Um, and as, as you go from an L dwarf to a T dwarf, again, you get the same set of clouds further down in the atmosphere, and, and you add on top sulfides and, uh, 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 <coughs> and, and uh, potassium chloride clouds, uh, along with the, the, the advent of methane in the atmosphere. And even more interesting, you start to get uh, uh, gaps in these clouds. You start to get patchy clouds. And so instead of just being you know, a, a single cloud layer covering, covering the object, uh, you start to you know, be, be able to you know, see differences in, in uh, uh, the clouds as you go further down. And so again, uh, you push from the T dwarfs to the Y dwarfs. Uh, I'm going to use the you know, best example of a Y dwarf I have, which is Jupiter. Uh, and you see like, you know, really interesting cloud structures going on there. And so you have ammonia clouds, water clouds on Jupiters. Uh, uh, you know, different layers, patchiness. Uh, uh, you can you know see down the different layers depending on whether you're looking at at, at the at a cloud uh, cloud deck or looking at the gaps between clouds deeper down. And just to sort of drive this point home, uh, this is what Jupiter looks like in the visible. This is what Jupiter looks like in the uh, infrared. And so again, the the amount of light you see from Jupiter depends on what the cloud structure is doing. And in particular, if there are gaps between clouds, uh, they, they appear, uh, those appear as very, very bright spots. If there's a gap bet uh, between the clouds, you can look quite deep into the atmosphere of Jupiter. You can see the much hotter la layers down there, which then, allows, which then you know, gives off a lot more light than the cooler layers on top. And so the gaps between the clouds provide this little extra bit of brightness. So it, it's pretty easy for, for an object like Jupiter. Jupiter is quite close by. We can take this beautiful resolved image of the surface. Uh, but we have really no chance of, of uh, you know, taking these beautiful images for any brown dwarf or planet outside our own solar system. There's just you know, uh, no hope of building a telescope big enough uh, to get that level of resolution. But we can cheat. We, we can, uh, we, we can uh, try to reproduce what these things look, look like through some clever observations. So uh, imagine this little toy model here. We have a planet that's rotating and has a green splotch, a red splotch, and a blue splotch on it. And as it rotates, uh, you know, different amounts of blue, uh, green, blue, and red uh, rotate into and out of your field of view. And if you just plot the amount of red light versus time, blue light versus time, green light versus time, you can sort of reconstruct what's happening on the surface of this object uh, based on how much uh, uh, you see as the object just rotates, you know, over the course of uh, however long its rotation period is. And so here's an example of that, you know, in, uh, for an actual brown dwarf. This is uh, about uh, uh, six days of data here. Uh, 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 on four separate nights. Uh, you know, the span here is about four hours for the, th for the third night here. And this is brightness versus time. And so you see this variability where uh, about a couple percent variability, uh, it goes from you know, relatively bright to getting fainter, brighter again, fainter, brighter. And what you're looking at is the brown dwarf uh, rotating. It's about a, a three, three hour rotation period. And as it rotates, uh, there are some gaps in the cloud that rotate towards us and then rotate out of the field of view and, and then back again. And you see this variability, this, this uh, 
uh, a change in the brightness due to the fact that this object is rotating and has these gaps in the cloud. So you can trace out not just the, uh, the rotational period, uh, the, the amount of patchiness of the clouds. And in fact, you notice the variability is not constant. It doesn't come back to the exact same shape over and over again. The clouds are evolving as we watch. They're, they're, they're uh, going away in some places and coming back in others. Um, sort of the best example of this is, you know, again, closest brown dwarf to the sun, uh, Lumen 16. In particular, the lower mass member of the binary, Lumen 16b, uh, Ian Crossfield uh, uh, used uh, the Very Large Telescope in Chile uh, to put together this map of the surface. And he used a clever trick, which was not to just monitor brightness over time, but also uh, to monitor the spectra at the same time, and therefore record the Doppler shifts of the material. And so he was able to tell, you know, not just that, uh, uh, you know, that there are you know, bright splotches and, and dark splotches coming in, but could actually figure out where on the planet uh, uh, in, in, um, in latitude the, those, the, the, those bright and dark regions were. And as a result of putting that all together, he could create a surface map of what the clouds actually look like for this object. And so this is you know, an actual you know, map of, this, of the surface of, of, the, of the cloud layer of this brown dwarf that's just a, you know, a few light years away. And as an aside, uh, Ian has a great website here uh, that will allow you to cut out this little model of Lumen 16 uh, and get a, either a cube-shaped or a sphere-shaped, uh, depending on how good you are with scissors and folding, uh, uh, for, for Lumen 16. So uh, just, just, just Google Ian Crossfield and Lumen 16 um, and uh, the, the, these great patterns you can download and print out. Okay. All right, so I promised in the title that the question of uh, where do brown dwarfs actually fit in? Um, you know, should we think of them more as failed stars? Should we think of them as overachieving planets? Uh, you know, on this continuum of mass from the, the stars down to the giant planets, where should we think of brown dwarfs? Are they more like their, you know, planetary, uh, their, their planetary uh, little brothers or more like their, their star or, uh, older siblings? And to think about that, um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a detour uh, out of astronomy and back into humans. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this, this, this graph is with very little context. Uh, th this is a graph showing uh, fat mass index versus fat-free mass index. Uh, th these two measurements, they're basically a derivative of the body mass index, which is your weight divided by your height, but it's broken up into how much of, your, uh, how much of that mass is due to fat and how much that uh, mass is due to everything else, particularly muscle. And so if I ask you, you know, uh, do, does it look like the, the, the people represented by these purple dots are the same population as the people represented by this, these red dots? Hopefully you would say no, th th these look like two different populations. Again, I've given you no, t no context, I, I haven't told you, you know, what's going on with these two objects, but you'd probably say to yourself, something is different. There, there's something different for, for, the, uh, for the purple set of points compared to the red set of points. Something different in formation or, or uh, uh, development over time. Uh, something, uh, so, you know, so, something is fundamentally different about these two populations. And sure enough, uh, the purple population represents men who have not uh, undergone any particular training, and the red represents secretory class sumo wrestlers, the, the, the highest rank of sumo wrestlers. And so without knowing anything about you know, sumo, wrestling, uh, uh, sumo wrestlers' uh, dietary uh, requirements or their training regimen, uh, we're able to tell that there's you know, two different populations at work here just by looking at the demographics. And I highly recommend this paper, Hierarchical Differences in Body Composition of uh, Professional Sumo Wrestlers, where I pulled this plot from. But you know, it's a great example of how, you know, with d demographics, uh, you can learn a lot about uh, formation, about development, uh, just by being very clever about what, what measurements you make and, and how you consider objects of uh, different types. Okay, so our goal is to do something similar for, for brown dwarfs and planets. If we can find the right uh, set of variables, the, you know, the, the equivalent of fat-free mass index and fat mass index, can we, can we make a plot where the brown dwarfs are clearly separate from the planets? or do we make plots where they're, they're the same distribution? And that's what we're really aiming to do. And so this brings me to the, the, the project I'm currently working on, uh, which is called the Generate Planet Imager Exoplanet Survey, or GPIES, uh, the, the, go the goal of which is to discover uh, planets and brown dwarfs, to characterize them, and really to push at the, the fundamental nature and how they formed and evolved over time. And really to answer these key questions, are planets and brown dwarfs you know, really the same population or are we looking at you know, two uh, different sets of objects that form differently? The, the technique we use to, to discover these brown dwarfs is something called direct imaging. And the idea is uh, you know, straightforward enough. You take a picture of a star and you see if there's a planet or a brown dwarf orbiting that star. 
Um, it, it's a stra straightforward technique, but it's actually quite challenging technically. And the example we always give is imagine that you're staring directly into the beam of a lighthouse and you're trying to spot a firefly that's sitting on the, uh, on the lighthouse beam. That, that's sort of the order of magnitude we're looking at. The you know, planets tend to be about a million times fainter than their parent star, and so you need a way of just digging out uh, underneath the glare of the star uh, to see the planet of the brown dwarf that's hiding on, uh, behind it. But remember, we know the trick. If we can go for young objects, we have a better chance. Young planets, young brown dwarfs, they're hotter, they're brighter than their older counterparts. So if we can limit ourselves to young stars, we have a better chance of seeing uh, the planets and the brown dwarfs uh, that, are, that are orbiting them. Uh, we have to do one more trick as well. Um, you know, I, I know we all love the atmosphere, it allows life and things like that, but as it turns out, it's really awful for astronomy. Uh, the, the atmosphere does just horrible things to, to the light from stars uh, as it passes through, uh, through the air. And so we have to use adaptive optics to correct for the things the atmosphere is doing and to you know, restore the, the, the light to, to what it was before it hit our atmosphere. And just as an example, uh, here's an astronomical object, uh, image with one of the, uh, the largest, uh, most sensitive uh, tel uh, telescopes in the world. I'll give you a minute to try to guess what object that is. If you guess the planet Mer uh, Neptune, you are correct. Uh, so you know, this, is, this is, you know, the, the same telescope uh, say, uh, looking at the same planet, uh, you know, without adaptive optics and with adaptive optics. So, uh, you know, this, this is, you know, a really nice te uh, set of technologies that allows you to, that's allowing us to, uh, uh, you know, uh, get uh, uh, correct for what the atmosphere is doing. And in the case of looking for planets and brown dwarfs, to really get behind the, the glare of the star and see what's going on. And so, um, as, as an example of what you can do with this, uh, this, is, this is the uh, HR 799 system. This is a system of four giant planets orbiting a nearby star. The stars in the center has been blocked out by, uh, by the instrument, and we see uh, this movie that, that runs about you know, eight years long, uh, showing these four giant planets between about five and eight times the mass of Jupiter uh, orbiting uh, that star over this eight-year period. And they obey Kepler's laws like they should. The inner one uh, moves the most, the outer one moves uh, quite slowly. Um, but you know, this is an example of what you can do with direct imaging. Uh, you, can, you, know, you can detect these planets, you can study them, you can watch them go about their orbits. Um, and the whole goal of the GPI survey is to find more of these objects, is to study the, the ones we already know about, to, to add more to the list. Uh, and to really get a you know, uh, uh, handle on you know, where they came from and uh, uh, what we can learn about them. So this is a, a little slide here uh, uh, just showing the, the GBIS team. There's about 100 of us uh, scientists and engineers all working together to try to uh, you know, make this uh, uh, project uh, a success. Uh, we're based at, uh, the, 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 the instrument is based at the a telescope called Gemini South uh, in, the Chile, in, the, uh, uh, in Chile. Uh, here it is atop uh, uh, Sarah Pashan, the, um, uh, the summit of, of the mountain there. This, this is the Gemini South Dome. Inside is an eight meter mirror, so about uh, 24 feet uh, 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 edge to edge there. Uh, it's a beautiful primary mirror, um, uh, allowing us to get you know, really good resolution uh, on, on the objects we image. And just before you know, we observe, uh, we, we all you know, go to visit GPI here, hanging off the back of the telescope. So again, this is the mirror up here, pointing upwards. And this blue box here is GPI hanging off the bottom of the telescope. So you know, it, 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 it's a mountain, so some nights are not so good. And you try to control, console yourself with a long exposure camera and a, and a flashlight and making uh, you know, frowny faces to draw attention to the unfortunate number of clouds there in the sky. And, and some nights it's quite good. Uh, it's you know, just a uh, you know, beautiful sky up there, uh, you know, uh, relatively far from city lights. Ignore those city lights in the, in the background there. Um, but you know, just, just you know, nice, uh, you know, uh, beautiful night sky there, um, uh, uh, allowing us to go and look for planets. As an aside, this is Beta Pick. It has a planet we're orbiting it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, one of our big discoveries with GPIs uh, was the discovery of a planet called 51 Eridani B. This was uh, relatively early on in the campaign. Uh, we discovered this planet, a uh, beautiful artist conception here. It's about uh, two and a half times the mass of Jupiter, uh, orbiting out at about 13 AU, so the equivalent of a little bit beyond the, uh, the orbit of Saturn in our own solar system. Uh, and it's you know, a, 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 a T dwarf type planet uh, um, orbiting a relatively young star. This is what the uh, actual data coming off of GPI looks like. 
uh, GPI takes data in such a way that we can produce an image at a series of wavelength slices and stack them upon, uh, on each other. And so this movie is, is running through wavelength, uh, showing the spectrum of the object uh, as we go, and each individual object, uh, each individual image shows the, uh, uh, the data we have at that particular wavelength. And so right here you see the planet pop up and then fade into the noise. And the reason it's, uh, the spectrum is changing so much is just because of uh, 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 how these T-dwarf spectra actually look. There's, there's a lot of methane absorption here on the right, a lot of uh, uh, water absorption here on the left, and flux can really only escape between those two absorption bands, and so you get this peak of emission uh, between the two molecular bla uh, bands on either side. Zooming out a bit to the, the full spectrum, uh, this is sort of almost a, you know, a classic T-dwarf spectrum. A lot of these you know, peaky, emission, uh, 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 peaky emission features in between uh, you know, really deep absorption bands from molecules. Um, and so from the spectrum, we're able to pull out the temperature, we're able to pull out the amount of you know, patchiness of the clouds uh, on, on the surface, and, and a lot of the, you know, just the fundamental properties of the atmosphere uh, based on this you know, really exquisite spectrum we get from this planet. And so again, you know, this is a planet about uh, uh, 100 ish light years away. Uh, that we're able to, you know, really get, you know, just exquisite detail on, uh, thanks to the the high fidelity of the uh, of the GPI instrument. Okay, so um, in addition to 51 Airy, uh, we also discovered a brown dwarf uh, HD 2562. That's the brown dwarf there. Uh, the, the the trick in direct imaging is you always look for the little arrow, and that tells you where the uh, the planet of the brown dwarf is. So yeah, uh, so you know, we have a series of of planets. Uh, 51 Airy, new discovery. Uh, recovered uh, previously known planets uh, uh, that, that, that were known before the survey began, also pulled out some uh, previously known brown dwarfs as well, uh, and ended up with a, you know, a pretty good yield of uh, uh, planets and brown dwarfs based on the hundreds of stars we looked at. And so I like to condense this all into a single plot uh, that I like to call the tongue plot. And th there's a lot going on here, so I'm gonna try to walk you through it, uh, through it a little bit slowly here. So on the x-axis here, we have seven major axis and astronomical units. This is the distance from the star. So uh, Earth lives at one AU from the sun, Saturn lives 10 AU from the sun, and so moving out, getting further and further away from the star. Mass is on the y-axis here. Uh, from one Jupiter mass up to 13 Jupiter masses, the line between planets and brown dwarfs, up to about 75 Jupiter masses, the line between, plan uh, between brown dwarfs and between stars. The red dots are the detections. These are the uh, uh, six planets and three brown dwarfs uh, that we found uh, from the GPI survey of the first 300 stars. So 300 stars, nine detections here. And finally, the colors and the contours show the sensitivity of the survey, the number of stars where we could have seen a planet or a brown dwarf of the given mass and seven major axis. And so, for example, these brown dwarfs, there, there are 160 stars where we could have seen a brown dwarf uh, uh, like these things. And so that gives us the rough frequency of these objects by, by knowing how many stars we could have seen them, uh, seen them around and how many we actually saw. It's roughly three out of 160 is the occurrence rate of brown dwarfs. Uh, as, as you move down to the, the tip of my tongue, as I like to say, uh, down to these two objects here on the 16 star contour, uh, we're much less sensitive to giant planets and that implies a much higher occurrence rate given that we were barely sensitive to planets down here and yet we picked up two. And so everything in the survey is encoded in this one very busy plot. Uh, what we actually saw and what our sensitivity was. And by careful analysis of this, uh, we can try to work out what the underlying distribution was actually like. And so, for example, one of the tricks we can play is to break things up by stellar mass, break things up by the mass of the host star. Uh, so I'm just gonna move everything that's above one and a half solar masses, anything bigger than 1.5 times the mass of the sun, move, move all the stars, all the objects around them to the right, and everything below that line, uh, below one and a half solar masses to the left. And what you see is all the planets, they, they, they're orbiting the higher mass stars. This is surprising for a couple of reasons. One, there's fewer high mass stars in our sample, and two, we're less sensitive to planets around these higher mass stars. And so one of the really big uh, uh, results from the GPI survey is this you know, uh, really clear statistical evidence uh, that, planets, that these giant planets, these wide separations, are just you know, inherently more common around higher mass stars. Uh, this is something that we had hints of for a while, but you know, really nailed down thanks to our you know, uh, really large sample size and our high sensitivity. Okay, but again, the, the question we really want to answer is planets versus brown dwarfs. What, uh, what, what does the results of the GPI survey tell us about that? And to, to get to that question, I'm gonna uh, take a, a quick step back here, uh, talk a little bit about how stars and planets actually form. 
Uh, so stars form uh, in, in what are called molecular clouds. Uh, clouds of gas and dust uh, that are collapsing, getting colder, uh, 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 collapsing down, um, and uh, forming a star at the center. So this is the, the Eagle Nebula. Uh, these uh, little tufts there are molecular clouds that are collapsing with, with young stars forming in the middle there. Inside one of those molecular clouds, uh, th there'll be a little region that's a little bit more dense than the rest. It'll start collapsing and a star will form in the center. And as that star forms, material will, will form a, a disk around that star, a flat sort of, uh, a, 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 you know, flat disk of material uh, orbiting that star. And in this case, you know, if you're forming a binary star, you have two, uh, two little uh, clumps in the, in the cloud that are uh, collapsing down next to each other and will eventually form a binary orbiting each other. So this is the way that stars form. They're, they're, they're uh, clumps in the cloud that, that collapse, uh, gravity pulls them together, and you get this disk around them. Uh, planets, in turn, will then form inside that disk. So that disk that's currently forming the star, planets are going to form uh, uh, through that disk by pulling material down onto them via gravity uh, and, uh, start, and uh, uh, getting bigger and bigger as they pull in material uh, uh, from that disk. And, and you see in this beautiful artist's conception here, these big rings open up here with these uh, gaps as, as the planets uh, eat up more and more material. So a beautiful artist's conception. Uh, this one looks like in real life. Uh, this is a wonderful image from uh, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, or ALMA, of the young star HL Tau, uh, where you see something very similar. You see these, r these concentric rings around the star, stars in the center there, uh, with, with gaps between them uh, that could easily be caused by planets forming uh, inside of this disk. Okay, so how do the planets actually form inside the disk? Well, we have two competing theories for uh, the way you can get a planet uh, to, to show up in this disk. Uh, one of them is this bottom-up process called core accretion. And the idea here is that you have solid material in the disk. You have ices and rocks uh, that will come together uh, via gravity. They'll collide. Uh, they'll uh, you know, build up into a larger and larger solid core uh, and eventually accrete gas onto itself. And so it's essentially a two-step process. So if you want to form uh, a planet like Jupiter, uh, first you need to build about 10 Earth masses of, of solid material into a core. So again, the, the, the gas, the, the, the ices and the, uh, and the rocks in the, in the disk need to form about you know, 10 Earth masses of solids. And once you get to 10 Earth masses, your gravity is now strong enough that you can pull down gas from, from the rest of the disk. You can, you can pull on about 300 Earth masses of gas onto your 10 Earth mass core. So you start out with a you know, small amount of, of solids and you end up uh, becoming a giant planet just by the amount of uh, gas you're able to pull, uh, pull down from, uh, from your, your gravity. I like to think of this a little bit like uh, compound interest. Uh, it, it's you, you put in a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, and eventually it pays off uh, big if you're, if you're able to wait long enough to, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the dividends to really come in. And this is very much a race against time because this, this gaseous disk here, it only lasts for about five or 10 million years before it's blown away by the young star. And so it's, it's, it's a race that you have to, uh, you, uh, that the planet has to build up uh, uh, the core fast enough so that there's still enough gas left over uh, for it to make a giant planet before the gas is gone forever. So if this is a little bit like compound interest, uh, the other method is a bit like learning you have a long lost uncle who's left you a $10 million inheritance. It's, it's called gravitational instability. This is where you, uh, material is basically just thrown onto the planet very, very quickly. Instead of taking millions and millions of years, in this simulation, it takes about 400 years. It, it, it's you know, much, much faster. And what's happening here is uh, you have a disk. Uh, the, it, it's, it's not a you know, perfectly smooth disk. There, there's areas that are a little bit more dense than others. As the material in the disk orbits around the stars, those dense regions uh, start to get more dense. The, the gravity of, of uh, overdensity uh, pulls in more material to it, and you very quickly form giant planets uh, uh, just, just, by the just by the self gravity of the material in the disk. Uh, if anything, it, it's almost too efficient. It's just so easy using this method uh, to form you know, very large planets uh, all throughout the disk. So we have these two competing methods of, of uh, uh, two competing theories of how you'll actually form giant planets in the disk. And we can ask the question then, what do they predict? What, what do they predict that GPI should have seen from the 300 stars we looked at if either one of those is true? Start with core accretion. Um, so, so, so core accretion is, is uh, much more efficient around higher mass stars. So you'd expect to have more objects around higher mass stars if core accretion holds. Um, 
Similarly, core accretion is, is this race against time. You have to form your object very, very fast before the gas disk goes away. And so you expect to see more low mass planets than high mass planets. It's harder to get more gas onto the, onto the planet if the gas disk is going away, away in just a few million years. And finally, the, the, the preferred location uh, for these objects to, uh, to actually form uh, under the core accretion scenario, uh, very close to what's called the snow line, uh, where, where uh, uh, water and other material can, for, can uh, freeze into ices. And so you expect uh, planets to be closer in compared to further out. And you get very different uh, predictions from the other method, from the gravitational instability method. Uh, it, it doesn't actually care what the mass of the star is. It, it's sort of uh, the, the efficiency is uh, independent of the mass of the star. Um, you tend to get more high mass companions than low mass companions. It's just such an efficient method uh, that it's really easy to just keep adding mass and to get planets, to get more brown dwarfs, to get you know, very high mass companions uh, through this method. And unlike, uh, unlike core accretion, it will form objects anywhere in the disk. There's no preferred location to put a planet uh, that they should appear uh, throughout the disk. Okay, so we have these two different predictions for where we should find objects. Which of them actually matches observations? Well. Core accretion actually matches the planets that we saw with GPI, and gravitational instability matches the brown dwarfs. And so, for the first time, we're actually you know, seeing some you know, tentative evidence that we actually have different formation mechanisms for the planets and for the brown dwarfs, uh, at least in these wider separations where GPI is sensitive. And so, again, this is you know, small numbers. We, you know, we only have uh, less than a dozen objects. Uh, but but the, the you know, early results are you know, uh, uh, pretty interesting and in pointing us to this you know, really interesting direction uh, that we're seeing a difference in formation uh, for the planets and the brown dwarfs and that these aren't just the, you know, the same uh, uh, set of objects all formed in the same way, but there's a you know, different formation and so there's a different underlying uh, 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 history behind the, the, the two sets of objects. Okay, so again, early results. Uh, we're, we're still looking at the, the uh, remaining stars in the survey. Uh, we've mostly finished up our survey at Gemini South. Uh, we have plans for the future now to go, uh, uh, Gemini has two observatories, uh, one in the south, one in the north. Uh, this is, again, GPI here with uh, friendly onlooker, uh, onlookers in the back. And, and we have an uh, ongoing plan uh, to upgrade GPI, to make it even more sensitive, to be able to make, pull out you know, even fainter planets uh, from the data. Uh, and move it to Gemini North. And so the hope is, you know, you go to the Northern Hemisphere, there's, there's more stars that are accessible to you, uh, and, and we can, you know, uh, continue the survey and, and hopefully you just, you know, make these results even more robust. Um, one more way we're gonna learn about brown dwarfs going uh, forward is there's a space telescope called Gaia. And Gaia is, uh, uh, has been up for about two, uh, two or three years now. Uh, it's observing every single star in the sky um, and very precisely measuring their position over time. And so it, it doesn't go quite faint enough to see many brown dwarfs by itself, uh, but Gaia is going to see the stars uh, with brown dwarfs orbiting them, you know, uh, showing the reflex motion. The star is going to move slightly on the sky in response to the gravity of the brown dwarf orbiting it, and we can actually pull out a lot more brown dwarfs uh, indirectly through Gaia and actually get their masses uh, uh, through, the, through the Gaia orbits, which is pretty exciting. And finally, a connection uh, uh, to, here, to here at SLAC, uh, LSST is going to help a lot. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, the camera for which is being built uh, uh, here at SLAC, uh, LSST is actually on the same mountain as Gemini South, uh, just a little bit off to the right here outside of this, uh, uh, the field of view here is Gemini South. And here at LSST, it's going to be an eight meter telescope. It's going to survey the entire sky every couple of nights. It's going to be you know, really sensitive to, to brown dwarfs and hopefully pull out you know, a lot more. So again, you know, we, we've, uh, in the past 30 years, we've found about uh, uh, 2,000 brown dwarfs, uh, going from zero to 2,000 in just about 30 years. Uh, again, we have a long way to go. There's about 40 billion in the, in the, in the Milky Way galaxy, but you have to start somewhere. OK, and so I think I'll stop there and just take any questions. Thank you. Talk. Um, we will take a number of questions, but um, the way the system works here, those of you who have visited here before already know that you have to raise your hand, in which case, if I recognize you, you have to push a little button and the light goes on on the uh, microphone and then you can start speaking to the microphone so we don't have to have microphone runners here. Okay, so uh, if there are any questions, so let's, let's start with you. Yes. Um, you talked about fusing hydrogen and fusing deuterium, which happens in brown dwarfs. Um, are there a class of stars that fuse lithium, even though they're not hot enough to fuse hydrogen? 
So, so yeah, so uh, um, all stars are going to fuse lithium. Um, they're going to, uh, most stars will run through their entire primordial batch of lithium quite quickly. Um, some stars, uh, I didn't quite get it to here, but, but some of the higher mass stars, their convect convective envelope is actually uh, uh, quite shallow. And so they can actually preserve their lithium for much longer because the lithium at the surface never makes it down to the core. Uh, but every star is going to try and get rid of all of its lithium, but it's such a trace amount. Remember, that for, for every one lithium atom, you have a billion hydrogen atoms. So most of the energy of the star is going to come from hydrogen. Uh, but but the, the, the lithium is just sort of this extra little bit of uh, uh, additional boost. So, I mean, a star with less than 75 um, Jupiter masses, it would not fuse lithium? Um, so, uh, it, as, as always, the astronomy, the answer is tricky. Uh, for, for the low mass brown dwarfs, about, uh, down about below about 50 Jupiter masses, they will never fuse their lithium. Uh, it turned out actually that, that the higher mass brown dwarfs uh, actually do fuse their lithium uh, a little bit at a time. So, the higher mass uh, brown dwarfs, the core will actually get hot enough for a brief period of time uh, where we'll uh, fuse some of that lithium away. So, uh, th there's actually a, a differentiation in brown dwarfs between those that fuse lithium and those that don't. Thank you. So you're, uh, you're getting light curves off of the, your iron, li liquid iron clouds and so forth. How are you filtering, if, how do we filter that in transit data for smaller stars, you know, like M-class stars and, and below? We're trying to find planets using uh, transit data. So, so yeah, so, so um, th there's a neat trick you can use with transiting planets as well, uh, which is um, uh, what we call phase curves. And so what happens is if you have a planet that's close enough to, to a star, it actually gets tidally locked. Just, just like the moon shows the same face to us as it orbits, uh, these planets show the same face to their star uh, as they go around. Just because they're so close to their star, they feel these in, in immense tidal forces. And what that means is that there's a hot spot that's always, you know, that, that's basically bathed in perpetual sunlight and a, and a dark spot that's always in nighttime. And so there's a huge temperature difference between the, the, the front of the planet and the back of the planet. And so there's actually really cool observations using the Spitzer Space Telescope and others uh, that as the planet goes around, you see the combined light of the star plus planet get a little bit brighter and a little bit fainter as the bright spot of the planet points towards us and then points away from us. And so you can actually map out the temperature structure of these transiting planets uh, based on these phase curve uh, measurements, looking at the bright side and the, and the dark side of the planet. Um, so you mentioned during the lecture that the stars surrounding the sun are more red, or there's more red stars. Why is that? Um, so yeah, so, so basically it just comes down to the way that stars form. Uh, there, there's a huge preference for making lower mass stars than there is for making the higher mass stars. It's, it's just um, the, the fundamental physics of you know, how these uh, 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 little overdensities in the clouds form. Uh, most of the, the overdensities that form tend to be on the, on the lower mass end. And so lower mass stars are red, and so most of the stars you know, near the sun are, are actually quite red. So uh, you know, again, it's, it's, almost, it's almost 10 to 1. You know, most of the stars are these lower mass stars, and then just a tiny fracture of the ones like the, like the sun are bigger than us. Thank you. So you talked quite a bit about um, uh, brown dwarfs that are orbiting stars. Do we believe there are large populations of brown dwarfs that are um, not orbiting stars, that are in between stars? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, you've seen my bias where, where I look for faint things next to bright things. So, so I spent most of the talk uh, uh, discussing uh, the brown dwarfs orbiting stars, uh, but there's been you know, just incredible work uh, seeing isolated brown dwarfs. So, so either brown dwarf, brown dwarf binaries or just isolated brown dwarfs. And with the advent of you know, large scale surveys that, that survey the entire sky, especially in the infrared, uh, we've detected you know, really thousands of these objects. Um, and so, you know, there, there are quite a few. It's uh, more difficult for them because we can't, uh, if there's a, uh, a brown dwarf orbiting a star, we know what the age of the system is based on knowing how old the star is. If there's a brown dwarf by itself, it's a little bit more difficult to piece together what's going on there. But we still have, you know, these really large samples of just isolated brown dwarfs all over the sky. So you've, you've said, you know, uh, the cooler stars, the smaller stars are far more populous. Do we have any reason to, or what, what do we believe the population of brown dwarfs is, say, relative to M stars? Um, yeah, so, 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 so the numbers we have from the solar neighborhood is that for every 350 star, uh, uh, there's about 50 brown dwarfs. So it's about seven to one. Um, and and uh, as to how, uh, whether there are more high mass brown dwarfs than low mass brown dwarfs, that's actually an, an area of active study right now. And, and we're actually hoping to be able to get some more data shortly to answer that. have to push the button on, yeah. yeah. 
That's it. Doesn't doesn't Kenny? Oh. Nope. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Maybe uh, Go ahead. let let you ask first, and then you're next. Okay, so you have to turn your microphone off for a sec. Okay. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Can a brown dwarf have small planet-like objects? If so, have you found one that has it? If not, um, is it not possible? Yeah, so, so that's actually a great question. Um, in fact, the, the first uh, planetary mass object found outside the solar system uh, via direct imaging uh, was orbiting a brown dwarf. Uh, it's, it's, it's a brown dwarf uh, with the creative name 2 mass 1207. Uh, it was about a 27 Jupiter mass brown dwarf orbited by about a five Jupiter mass uh, planetary mass object. And, and I keep saying the words planetary mass object for fun I, uh, uh, International Astronomy Union uh, uh, rules. Uh, a planet is a thing that orbits a star. And therefore, because it was uh, orbiting a brown dwarf, I am legally not allowed to call it a planet. Gu guards will rush in and tackle me if I try. But, but you know, you, you can easily get, uh, you know, planetary uh, uh, mass objects that, that orbit these brown dwarfs. And so, you know, how those form and, and whether that's different from normal planet formation, that, that's actually a really interesting question that uh, uh, we're trying to look into. What's the brown dwarf's name? Uh, so, so uh, um, the, the, this is the sad part of, about being an exoplanet astronomer, that, that all of our objects have very, very boring uh, uh, sort of uh, serial number type names. Um, the, the, the shorthand we use is 2 mass 1207 from the, the 2 mass survey, and 1207 is a shortening of a 15-digit uh, uh, number, which I can never remember. Um, um, but it's basically based on where in the sky it is. And so um, th there's actually been a, a, a nice uh, uh, recent movement uh, recently by the International Astronomy Union uh, to, to actually uh, uh, give names to some of these planets. Um, and about every year, uh, year or two, they, they actually have a, a public contest to actually suggest names for some of these objects. And so, you know, ho hopefully some of these, uh, um, you know, crazier serial numbers get replaced with something that's a little bit more, you know, uh, friendly to the years. What is the planet-like object's name? Uh, it's even more boring than you would think. Um, so so uh, in, in astronomy, when we find a binary star, we, we attach a B to the name of, of, of that, uh, a capital B to the name of the companion. So uh, for example, HR7, uh, 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 so Alpha Centauri uh, becomes Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B. When we find a planet, we attach a lowercase b uh, to the star's name uh, to, 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 show, to show that it's a, uh, you know, a, a planet and not a star. And then as we find more objects, they, they become, so HR799 has HR799 lowercase b, lowercase c, lowercase d, and lowercase e. And I feel very ashamed having to, you know, ad 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 admit the way we do things as astronomers. Uh, I thought there was one question here, so go ahead. For, uh, size of plants the size of Jupiter, isn't there a certain amount of the heat generated from by the gravitational contraction? Yes, yeah. So um, uh, I, I sort of left out, you know, where, where all this... Uh, 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 heat comes from why they're cooling over, over time, and a lot of it comes uh, from uh, the gravitational contraction uh, of the formation. They start out slightly larger. So I said that all planets and brown dwarfs are about the same size. That's mostly that's, that's, that's only half a lie. Uh, they, they, they all they all come down to about one Jupiter radius. They start out somewhere around two or one and a half Jupiter radius, and, th and they slowly contract over time. And so the the the, the temperature, the the uh, the brightness we see is them converting that gravitational potential energy. Uh, uh, into heat and therefore in, into brightness. And so uh, Jupiter, for example, right now, um, the, the, uh, the total amount of energy emitted by Jupiter uh, is about a half and half, half reflected light from the sun, half residual uh, gra uh, gravitational potential energy from the last little bit of collapse. Uh, so most of, most of the energy from the sun is coming out in the visible, the, the stuff we actually see. Most of the uh, gravitational collapse is coming out in the, uh, in the infrared. Yeah, yeah. Do you have confidence that you found pretty much all the uh, brown dwarfs, dwarfs in our uh, 10 parsec neighborhood? Very little confidence. Um, so, so, you know, the, uh, you know th these brown dwarfs can get, you know, incredibly, incredibly cold. A and so th th this, this wide dwarf category I mentioned, um, for, you know, most, uh, most of astronomy, uh, Jupiter was the, really the only example we had. I, I think it was only about... Uh, 
eight years ago that the, that the second wide dwarf was found, the first one outside of our solar system. And so again, these, these things can be you know, just incredibly faint. You know, the surface temperature of minus 20 uh, uh, C. So uh, it, it takes you know, really dedicated surveys. It takes, uh, uh, you know, do you need to go really far into the infrared to chase their flux? And so I think there's probably quite a few more in the solar neighborhood. So when I say 20 billion, that, that's probably a lower limit on, on how many are in the galaxy. So there's a question for my daughter. Why are brown dwarfs called brown dwarfs? Oh, I actually <laughs> skipped the most important part. Um, yeah. <coughs> so, so, so where does the name come from? Um, uh, uh, again, m more dumb astronomy names for things. Uh, we, we basically classify stars into uh, two types. The, the big ones we call giants, the small ones we call dwarfs. We're, we're, we're a very unimaginative lot. Um, and then if you think of, uh, of the M stars, th these are the reddest stars that we have. And, we, and uh, brown dwarfs were first uh, theorized about the 1950s, about 30 years before the first one was seen. Uh, but we already had sort of a rough idea of what they should look like based on what we knew about stars. And so uh, the, the, if, if you imagine a, um, a red star, a brown dwarf has to be even cooler than that, it has to be even redder than red. What's redder than red? Brown. Brown is sort of the, 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 the next thing that comes up when you think about something that's you know, uh, even cooler, even redder than the reddest star. And so it's, it's not a giant. It's small, therefore it's a dwarf. It's redder than red, therefore it's brown. And we, in a, in a you know, moment of just you know, beautiful naming, we call them brown dwarfs. All right, go ahead. For the brown dwarfs that are not orbiting a star, um, do you believe they formed differently, uniquely in themselves, or they were they flung out of a system? Uh, what what is the, uh, the, the the mindset there? The, 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 there are beautiful theories that, the, uh, for both those things. Uh, the, 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 there, there's uh, um, you know some of the pictures are you have molecular clouds, you have uh, uh, two forming stars orbiting each other, and then one gets flung out before it can accrete enough mass to become a star. So, so that's sort of the the accretion theory of how brown dwarfs come from. Uh, the other is just sort of that you know, they're just the low mass end of star formation that that you form you know a very small number of big objects, some number of, of small objects, and some number of the really uh, uh, small ones, and I, I'm not actually sure, you know, uh, uh, where theory has come down on it today. But there's uh, uh, a couple of competing theories as to, you know, how you form the isolated objects. All right, maybe we should take a last question at this point because I think we're running a bit short of time. But please go ahead. One of my colleagues at Apple asked me to ask you this: Could you talk a little about Planet X and how that got discredited or not? So, so, yeah. Um, and may maybe for some people you might need yeah. to define it. So, so, so I, I, I will freely admit that it, it's well beyond my, my field of study and, and I've, uh, I don't know the, the final answer on uh, you know, how, how it's thought of. The, the backstory was based on the distribution of Kuiper Belt objects, these uh, uh, sort of you know, comet-like uh, objects you know, beyond, the orbit of, uh, 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 beyond the orbit of Neptune, so things like uh, Pluto and these other large objects, that there seem to be signals in uh, uh, it, there seemed to be a sign in how they were distributed on the sky that seemed to indicate there was a, uh, a higher mass uh, object uh, uh, orbiting at the uh, wide, wider edge of the solar system. And I, I will unfortunately admit that I, I don't know the latest research as, as to uh, how things stand now, uh, but some of my colleagues are here and you can come up and ask afterwards and hopefully they have a better answer for you. Uh, at this point we probably should finish taking questions here, but if there are any pressing questions, few of us, Eric, uh, possibly Leah, myself, and, and maybe Bruce, will stand outside here and please don't hesitate to ask us uh, any questions. So let's thank <laughs> Eric again. And once again, I look forward to see you here in two months. Thank you. <laughs>